finally, Alison, <laughs> <laughs> we get to talk about and talk to you and, and hear from you. So, yeah, it's a real pleasure to have you come and um, share with us a little bit about your latest research on 2Y. So, Alison has been, I was just thinking, you know, that when I first read your work, it was all about social class and ethnicity, I guess, and gender. Feminism. Yes, Feminism all theory. those things, like a very long time ago. But And you've kind of really settled in this Māori Pākehā relationships um, area and increasingly historical work, right, around um, the early relationships between Māori and Pākehā, which is really exciting material. I was just telling Alison before that I'm on two-thirds of the way through Alison and Cooney's new book, Two I, um, which is... I highly recommend. It's a great follow-on from the recorded. Or I don't be not. You're going to show them, aren't you? Anyway, mm -hmm. um, beautifully written, very accessible and engaging, and just amazing to kind of learn more about these figures. I was just thinking about the way in which um, you know people live and they die. <laughs> they have these amazing. Everyone, these people have these amazing lives, and mostly they die and they're forgotten. And how you have really brought to why back to life, you know. Mm. So anyway, I will stop talking and hand over to you so you can tell us all about Tuai and also your kind of, your motivation really, isn't it, mm. for looking at this period, yeah? Mm. 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 Well, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, it's very nice to see you all on these funny little boxes in front of me. Um, it's a rather kia ora tepora. It's a kind of weird situation, but I'll, I'll make the best of it and apologise for any um, strangeness as we go through the process. We advertise this talk as um, focused on the period before the treaty and the importance of understanding this period. So um, I'm going to really kind of narrow down my focus um, to, as I put up on the screen there, it's really the, the period that's really interested me a lot is, is the 25 years between around about 1800 to 1825, um, which was a crucial period of time um, as Māori and Pākehā were establishing um, more day-to-day -day relationships. And that period absolutely dovetails onto the life of Tuai of Ngāri Raumati, who is a character um, who um, Kuni and I wrote about in our initial um, book, He Caught It or Words Between Us. I've got a screen. Could you? Um, um, yes, this, these are, no, that's all right. These are just the... These are just the publications, the most recent publications on Tuai and the period in which he lived. The words between us here, called it all, um, first Māori Pākehā conversations on paper, published in 2011. That really was a, a book about um, the establishment of the, the Māori establishment, really, of the first school and Māori initial engagement with um, pen and paper. Um, and then this next book, which has just come out, Two I, A Traveller in Two Worlds, takes one of the characters from that bigger story and talks about his, his life um, and really gets into some of the details that I want to um, talk about today and why it's useful and interesting learning about the details of a person's life at a certain time. Um, and the other one has just been published in the Journal of Polynesian Society, for those of you who want this sort of... I guess a Reader's Digest version, which hasn't got the pretty pictures and all the detail. But anyway, there's that one there as well. Can you? Yeah, those are the two um, book covers for those of you who haven't seen them. Um, and as um, Avril said, both of those are written for general consumption. I don't call them academic books if we see academic as kind of dry. Um, they are very much written for uh, the general reader who um, likes a story um, and who is very interested in this pre-treaty period. Okay, Abel. Um, as I said, I'm going to focus today around the life of a particular man. This is a picture of him that's on the front page of the book. His name is Tuai, or it could be Tui or um, Tituhi. There's various um, possibilities for his name and we're just using Tuai for a range of reasons that we explain in the back of the book. So that photograph's looking one way and this photograph's looking the other way. 
No, they're looking the same way. They're both oh. looking to the right. Um, and that was painted by um, James Barry in London in 1818. Um, Tuai was from Ngari Raumati, as I've said, which is in the southeastern uh, Bay of Islands. Um, and because his life dovetails into this period of time before the treaty, um, I want to talk about, about his life. Level, could you? So I guess these are the main points that I'm really wanting to make or to bring to the fore in telling Tuai's story. The, the significance of the 50 years or yeah, 45 years of, of a very intense engagement between Māori and Pākehā prior to 1840 it's astonishing, and I don't think any of you in the audience will have this assumption, but it is astonishing how many New Zealanders still assume that um, Pākehā just sort of turned up almost unannounced in 1840 and thrust some paper in front of Pākehā, who, uh, Māori, who turned up and, and signed this odd document. Um, nothing could be further from the truth because there were 50 years before that that of, of very intense uh, relationship development, um, which led directly, you could argue, to the treaty and the former treaty that we have and et cetera, et cetera. Now, my work in focusing on really up to 1825, 1826, doesn't take in the crucial 1830s period, which is a talk for perhaps another day. Um, but I just want to go through these, these bullet points, trying not to be too um, boring about it. But the, the things I want to emphasise about studying Tuai at this period was that we have to really think, uh, it's useful to think about the generational shifts that had occurred or were occurring in Māori society in relation to encountering Europeans. And really, it was round about 1800 when the um, intensity of Pākehā arrival um, here on these shores, particularly in terms of whaling and sealing and so on, um, start, that's really when um, the engagement became quite intense. Now, before that, before um, 1800, of course, we've got Cook, we've got Tasman, we've got a number of French and other visitors who had come intermittently to New Zealand shores, and unfortunately, most of those resulted in Māori rangatira and rangatira being captured and kidnapped and taken away, um, which meant that Māori were very anxious about um, Pākehā ships coming towards the, um, their, their lands. And those are incredibly sad stories. Um, that, and there seemed to be particularly one particular scientific, uh, some French um, people who wanted to study this part of the world, and I won't go into in detail, for example, captured a rangatira um, plus a canoe, which he wanted to take back to Paris to kind of show the world what was existing down here. And so taking a person was the idea you'd take someone to Europe to teach the Europeans um, and to develop their knowledge of this part of the world without any kind of understanding or thought for the, the lives of the people um, who were being kidnapped um, and the lives of the people that they left behind. Mm -hmm. Anyway, prior to, so prior to 1800, this was happening periodically, which meant that although Māori had learned um, following the visit of Cook in 1769 that, that Pākehā were human, um, which was something they were a little bit doubtful about at first, they then became very anxious about what kind of humans they were in, in the sense that they, um, they were prone to dishonesty um, and stealing people. Um, then, so, you, so two eyes really born in this first generation, they were the first Maori generation really to understand something about Pākehā, they go, went on the ships, Tuai as a child would have gone as a young boy out onto the ships, the whaling ships and so on that came and spent a lot of time with uh, Europeans on ships. So they weren't afraid of Europeans and also in 1793 some people were kidnapped um, and returned. Uh, and, and the fact that they were returned 
um, this is um, Tuki and Huru who went to um, Norfolk Island, Island. Yeah. the fact that they returned was hugely significant mm -hmm. because it showed the people that um, that Māori could go overseas and could return, whereas before it was assumed if you went, you never came back. Mm -hmm. So this was a huge moment. Also, Tuki and Huru from um, Norfolk Island brought back the information, brought back a relationship with a particular man, um, Philip Gidley King, who became um, the governor in, in New South Wales. They, so they came back with goods and they came back with a relationship. Now, this was really just at the time when Tuai was just before he was born, and this was really on the cusp of this change. So he was quite confident in dealing with Europeans, unlike his older brother and the generation of Hungihika. Um, who were um, by this stage, you know, really into their, um, I mean, at 1800, when was Hongeka born? But he would have been into his 20s probably then. Um, and so that, that, that generation was still of the old world. Two Eyes generation were of this new world, this utterly changing world. And the young children were the ones that were going to lead this change. And they were the ones that spent the time on the ships. So there's this whole, so there's a generational thing going on that's very exciting that Tuai was central, was, was part of. There's also, we have to always be very cognizant of the local politics, the local tribal enmities that are operating um, in this period that had a, an absolute impact on Māori's strategic engagement with Pākehā and also the pattern of settling, uh, of settling the Europeans. Um, and, and often these, the local politics, the local tribal um, alliances and non-alliances that were constantly shifting, particularly in the Bay of Islands, is, is sometimes overlooked. Um, another aspect of the story is the astonishing social and political agility, cultural agility, um, of the tupuna Māori, the Māori ancestors who were engaging with Pākehā. And, and, and their desire to integrate in this, um, I guess, European technologies and so on, and European gods, potentially, clothing, etc., etc., into Te Ao Māori. Um, and we see constant examples with Tuai, with the way that he was utterly agile and the way that he understood how culture worked, which is a very modern idea. But the fact that he could, in New Zealand, he could um, understand his hair as tapu, but he could go to a barber in England and have his hair cut, for example. I mean, you know, that's not a trivial thing. That is a kind of massive um, ability to shift in thinking about how the world works. And also, too, I understood that the Pākehā had their god and that Māori had their gods, and that both of those had a place. Now, the fact that he could understand that and tell Pākehā um, that their, what they were, the missionaries, what they were saying about their god didn't necessarily apply to New Zealand or whatever, the fact that he could understand these as, as different beliefs existing, possibly existing alongside each other, again, that's quite a modern idea, I think, in, in, in many ways. And he had the ability, as did many of, obviously, his um, compatriots, to, um, to, to be flexible and agile and, and um, in, in, in flexible in, in their thinking, which I just find astonishing for, particularly compared with many of the Europeans which we encounter in these stories. Um, the other thing is the role of Māori in teaching Pākehā um, and contributing to European knowledge. And what I mean by that is the knowledge in Europe about Māori came from Māori themselves and particular people like Tuai who actively, on a number of occasions, actively taught Pākehā about Māori, about Māori language, about tikanga, about customs, as they were called, etc. And in a very teacherly kind of way, um, we've got a lot of evidence in here and some wonderful examples of the things that he talks about. He talks about marriage, the nature of marriage, um, warfare, cannibalism, uh, religion. It's, it's almost like a kind of, you know, this is 200 years ago, we've almost got a kind of social studies lesson going on here that Tuai is engaged in talking 
um, in that particular case to some French scientists um, who had visited here. And so his ability to to understand his own world, um, I, I think, is quite astonishing. Um, and the last, and the and the second to last thing is the the story really foregrounds the significance of individual relationships that are formed that form history in this particular case, and I think form all histories. <coughs> but the characteristics of loyalty, affection, generosity, and debt seem to be key aspects of the relationships that Tuai formed with others and other people around him formed with, with Pākehā particularly. And you can trace a whakapapa of relationships from 1793, that's the Norfolk event, directly towards the treaty. And so you can track who spoke to whom, who was related to whom, who wanted what in relation to that. You can actually almost draw a line like a map um, as relationships are formed and they affect other relationships and so on. So there's a, there's a fascinating um, set of stories in there about individual relationships and of course for Māori in particular, those relationships with an individual were relationship with hapū. Um, and so those, those are characteristic of the story. And lastly, and I think this is probably the most important perhaps, um, Tuai's story, as I've said here on the, the um, overhead, provides a human day-to-day -day picture of the Māori study of Pākehā and the complex and intense emotional demands of the social change of the time. And I just think, Avril, before that I feel weirdly that my work is quite feminist <laughs> um, in that regard, in the sense that so many of these histories of this early period focus on leaders and who was killing whom and who was allied with whom and so on. But the very small day-to-day -day and emotional day-to-day -day life um, that, were that, that were, was required at this time of immense social change when relationships were forming and, and unforming and so on, you find these in the life of Tuai. This um, picture here is my favourite. It's a gorgeous silhouette that was done in England and when he was there in 1818. Um, it's the closest we're going to get to a photograph of Tuai because you know how silhouettes were made where you sit, a person sits in front of a screen and the light is shone from behind them and so then the, the, the um, silhouette is traced onto the other side of the screen. So you have a a very direct and very human, I just find this marvellous image. And I can see him as a live human being in this silhouette. Um, you can see his hair has been cut short at the front, which was very fashionable at the time in London for young men. Still is here, I think. Um, and he's also tied his he had long hair and it's tied up in a top knot um, at the back. Um, and he's wearing a, um, a neck kerchief or a collar. And he's got that wonderful sort of aquiline nose um, and those amazing lips and, 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 and chin. And you can just say he feels alive to me in that image. Um, and that writing underneath, Thomas Tuai, that's his writing. Um, okay, so let's move right along. Okay, so I'm going to go back and say something about um, Tuai and his the period of time in which he lived. Oh yes, before I start, one of the reasons I could tell the story I have, or Cooney and I, I have to say, I had forgotten to acknowledge my co-author, Cooney Jenkins, apologies, aroha mai. Um, well, the reason that Cooney and I could write the details, these emotional day-to-day -day details about Tuai, of course, was because he was the most written about Māori um, of this period, by a long shot. Um, he had, he was with Pākehā a lot um, and they had pens, uh, quills, and they wrote a lot about him and he lived with them literally and sleeping in the same room and so on and so forth. So they could write a lot of detail about just about, you know, um, what he had for breakfast in the morning. Um, and so we, and he was considered to be um, the great hope by the missionaries, the Church Missionary Society in London considered Tuai to be the great hope for the Church Missionary Society that he would be their key convert um, 
and come back to New Zealand having learned um, the scriptures, having been converted to Christianity and would be the key leader in New Zealand to lead social ch uh, and religious change. Um, and they failed at that, at that, at that job. Um, well, no, I shouldn't say they failed at that job. Tuai himself uh, resisted this particular um, pressure from them under huge stress, but resisted this pressure and returned to New Zealand unconverted and actually had turned against uh, the missionaries um, and, um, you know, very quite actively turned against the missionaries, partly because of their inability to communicate with him in a way that he thought he wanted to be communicated with. He was interested in the Pākehā God, but he didn't want to be forced to change the culture of his his people. When he came back from England, he actually was furnished, or he, he had written a list, his uh, his, his friend Titeri, who he travelled with, had written a list that the Church Missionary Society had made a, a series of statements about what they must achieve when they get back to New Zealand, when they came back in 1819. They had to get Māori people to stop fighting, to no longer have tapu and noa, uh, to stop getting tattooed, um, to stop, uh, women were to stop hanging themselves on their husband's death, which was a reasonably um, common practice, um, and so on. Uh, oh, that's right, and that women, women were to remarry quickly after their husbands died. So there were the sort of, they were, they were literally a list of cultural changes that, that Tuai was charged with, and, and of course, um, reading the Bible and loving the Englishman and the Englishman's ways, um, and believing that the Englishman's ways were better than the Maori man's ways. So th these were very, very simple, literal statements about the desires of the missionaries for Two Eyes' return um, after he came back from England. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, and I just want to give you a sense of one of the bullet points I made earlier about the significance of um, tribal enmities, of tribal politics, in understanding the march towards the treaty or the history prior to the treaty. On the screen, you've got a map of the Bay of Islands, um, EPPD, otherwise known as, um, and you can see there the territory of the Ngāri Raumati, and that is basically right up to Cape Brett, down um, and then swinging into the left Manawaora Bay, um, right up towards Russell. So that, and, and a number of those islands, um, particularly Moturua, um, Motukiakia, and some of those other islands as well, um, were the territory of um, Ngāri Raumati in these, in these early times. Now, this was a massive territory. They were extremely powerful um, confederation of hapū that gathered under the title um, Ngāri Raumati. On the left-hand side of the screen, you've got the Kerikeri Inlet. And do, can you just move to the next screen? Um, oh, yes. Before we move to the next one, just, just going to inter... Can we go back? No. You go back a bit. Go back one. If you have a look, you can put your cursor, actually, Avril, at Paroa Bay, which is just below... See where it says Manawa Ora Bay? Yeah. Yeah, just there. Yeah, that bit that sticks out, that was the territory particularly of Tuai and his older brother Korokoro and his um, his uncle Kaipo. Um, right, that was the sort of centre, if you like, of there. Now, that bit that sticks straight up towards the north under the M of Manawa Ora, that is Kahuwera Pa. And so if you just go to the next um, slide, this is a photograph of me taken a few years ago on the top of Kahuwera Pa, looking, it says, um, look, yeah, look, looking northeast. So there we are on the top of the Pa, which was um, Tuai and became Tuai's Pa, uh, looking out towards the islands um, of the bay. Uh, so that's the beautiful territory on which they, they had their um, Pa. Next one. 
So this was just taking us out a little bit further. The little red dot there on the right, you can see um, where that, yes, that picture was taken. So we've got Ngāri Raumati territory over there in that Te Rāwhiti area. On the left, um, towards Omapere and Kerikeri, that, that big area on that, the left-hand side, going right out towards the left of the map there, um, you've got the territory of um, Ngāpuhi. That was a, started as a small group that, that became very powerful and had a whole lot of um, allies, which, which um, historians call the Northern Alliance. Um, which were the enemies of the people at Ngāri Raumati. Um, I'm simplifying this, obviously. Um, the Bay of Islands itself, the, the richness of the Bay of Islands was a jewel in the crown of, of this area, and the Ngāri Raumati, the um, Ngāpuhi uh, alliances were moving steadily um, around this period to the, towards the east, um, and towards the southeast. There are also southern tribes that were at the bottom there below the um, Waikari Inlet as well. Um, but I won't go into that in a lot of detail, you can read that elsewhere. So what we have is two very large alliances facing each other across those ba that Bay of Islands. And in this very early, and around about 1800, there was a terrible battle of um, Tapika Point, which is just above um, Kororareka there, yeah, just up there, um, which was a major battle um, between Ngāri Raumati and Ngāpuhi, where, um, you know, there, there are a series of very important battles that were happening around about um, 1800, when just just as the, the ships were, were coming in, um, as I said, the Pākehā ships. Now, Tuai, being a young man, a young boy, very um, said he was he was very annoyed with all the anxiety about all the fighting. There's constant stress every day. He was having to rush out to a possible skirmish. Wanted to get away. Um, he was also very interested in Europeans. Um, he loved their clothing, their food. He was he was a, he was a man who was interested in in, in European life. He got a job um, on a ship, a whaling ship, and ended up doing a bit of whaling, um, and um, ended him and found himself in Sydney um, in 1813, and, and and probably a year or two before that as well. And in 1813, at that t in Sydney, he met Samuel Marsden, and he met Thomas Kendall. Samuel Marsden, you'll know, is um, was the leader of the missionaries who came to New Zealand, and Thomas Kendall was his offsider, who was going to be the school teacher here. Thomas Kendall, as we explain in our book here, Kōrero, um, came to New Zealand um, at the request of Ruatara from Ngā, from Ngāpuhi, from the northern part of the bay. Um, had requested a school teacher to come to teach the children to read and write. He had been in Australia doing the same thing as Tuai, exploring the Pākehā world, and had requested a teacher to teach the children to read and write. A teacher was being arranged by Marsden in Australia. Tuai turned up in Australia and Marsden said, you must go and live, or why don't you go and live with Kendall? He lives just down the road um, in Parramatta and teach him the Māori language um, to prepare him to come to teach in the Bay of Islands, which too I did. Next slide. Oh yeah, that's just a nice picture of two I. Mm -hmm. come back. That's yeah. Okay, that just two I. No, no. The two I two eyes on the left, the other one is um, we're not sure who that it could be he he. Um, so Tuai worked with Thomas Kendall, who was preparing um, writ the written language to teach the children to read and write because Māori language was not written down. And they worked together on this first New Zealand book um, that was published in Sydney in 1815. Um, the New Zealanders are called our North New Zealand, the New Zealanders' first book being an attempt to compose some lessons for the instruction of the natives. Um, and this was to be, next slide. Um, a book for the school. So that's just an example of what it looks like in that little book um, for teaching the children 
um, to write the language down. And you can see that the language is not what it appears to be today, uh, Māori language. Um, it, is yet, it is still in the process of being standardised. But that language was the language that was taught to Thomas Kendall by Tuai. So he was a key person in the um, teaching of Te Reo Māori to Pahiha uh, for the process of teaching the children um, of the Bay of Islands, the Māori children, to read and write. He also, at this time, um, was a go-between for Marsden. He carried a letter from Marsden to New Zealand, to the Bay of Islands, to um, Ruatara, uh, who was back here by that time, to say, we want to send people now. Is now a good time? Can we come? Do you still want us? Various things that happened in between times, and particularly the Boyd um, ship had been attacked in uh, Whangaroa Harbour and the Pākehā on board had been killed. Um, and so there was a lot of anxiety about whether Māori still wanted Pākehā to come to settle in New Zealand. Um, and Tuai was the one who took the letter to um, Ruatara and brought back, um, and, and the message was, was brought back with Ruatara, with Hongihika, um, to Australia to say, yes, we want you to come and we will bring you from Australia to New Zealand, these first New Zealand settlers. Now, the key thing here to remember is that Hongihika, his um, relation, Ruatara, who spoke English, he would have spoken at length with Ruatara about bringing the Pākehā here. This would not have been just a casual invitation. And Hongihika would have realised, and we see as time went on that it became very important to him, to have Pākehā living right there in the Northern Bay of Islands to empower his particular um, allies of, of Ngāpuhi. So Ruatara Tara and Nga, um, Hongihika went back to Australia to get the first Pākehā settlers to come, so they would put them exactly where they wanted them, in Ngāpuhi territory. At the same time, Tuai was the go-between. Tuai was from Ngāri Raumati, and he needed people for his part of the bay. So his brother, his older brother, Koro who would who challenged um, Hongihika in terms of their mana, he also came on the journey back to Australia to get the Pākehā settlers. So on that board, that ship, going back to get the first Pākehā settlers and then bringing them back to New Zealand, you've got two very powerful rangatira who hate each other, if I can put it like that, plus their lieutenants who spoke English, Ruatara on the one hand and Tuai on the other. Hongihika and Ruatara got those first settlers and they came to New Zealand in 1814 and they started, that's where the first school was. And so the first Pākehā settlement was there in the heart of, or at the side of, but in um, Ngāpuhi territory. Now Korokoro and Tuai from Ngāri Raumati could see the writing on the wall. They needed their settlers. One of the key things writing on the wall was the um, ability now of Ngāpuhi to amass tools and muskets, particularly from the trade and from the Pākehās who had come to settle amongst them. And they quite deliberately withheld um, pigs, for example, when the Pākehās were hungry and wanted pigs, um, Hungihika would say, I will trade you a pig, but you must give me a gun or however many guns. So there was a kind of gun trade started and quickly it was realised that um, Hungihika was um, a mass, you know, a, a able to get access to ammunition and guns. Korokoro himself was now starting to get guns as well from the uh, whaling ships. And he, um, he had 50 guns before Hungihika had any more than a, a, a half a dozen. So the sort of arms race was starting that was absolutely crucial to the survival of these two groups. Um, Tuai was intent on getting to England to get more settlers, um, to get settlers for his part of the bay. Um, Koro Koro would have been very keen for him to go. And he also was interested in studying European society. 
He uh, managed to get to England um, under the auspices of the Church Missionary Society, who paid for his um, and the, his um, journey, and also the journey of his friend Titiri. Um, and I don't say much about Titiri. He was a common man, actually from Ngāpuhi, but those two teamed up to travel together. Um, and the Church Missionary Society supported their passage believing that this was a great opportunity for conversion. And I've got this slide up, which is the most beautiful drawing uh, by Tuai that he drew while he was, when he got to London, it was winter. He immediately got very ill um, and there was a, a serious danger of him dying, as had Māori before him. I think he was the sixth Māori to get to Europe. Um, and a number had died on the way or um, on the way back. He was in danger of dying. And Kuni and I think that these are sort of waka wairua. They are they are ancestral um, vehicles, vessels for bringing them back uh, should they die in London. And they're they're the earliest Maori drawings on paper that we have. Um, okay, next. Um, Tuai stayed in this particular house in Shropshire. They were sent from London into the countryside to get better. Uh, we visited this, this wonderful house. Tuai and Titiri had that middle floor. The family, the, the um, Mortimer family, who he was the local reverend, they left the bottom floor. Tuai and Titiri had the middle floor. Those windows are just painted onto the house. They're not real windows because of the glass tax at the time. And the servants of the house lived in the top floor. Tuai and Titiri were very happy and comfortable at this house. They were not servants and very much saw themselves as not servants um, and um, were treated, uh, they had their own servants. In other words, the servants of the household were their servants as well, and they were very, very conscious overseas of their status um, as young rangatira, and um, they, um, you know, gained a lot from being in this place. One of the main things they gained from living in Shropshire, of course, was visiting the Ironbridge Gorge, which is just near this house, and near the, the, the gorge behind, um, and experienced the Industrial Revolution, um, including the iron, um, melt the melted iron, the molten iron, um, the mines, the etc. And also the conversation about the possibility of finding iron in New Zealand um, and um, being able to uh, form mines in New Zealand. So these conversations were happening in um, in England um, with Tuai, who was very interested in the possibilities of these technologies being transferred um, to New Zealand. Do you want to move next? Oh yes, this is a beautiful drawing he also drew um, while he was in England, while he was ill. Um, it's a picture of Koro Koro's face, his brother's face. Astonishingly detailed um, moko that he's drawn there as he, as he um, remembers his brother and draws his brother close to him. Uh, and that's his own writing. He was being taught to write, and that's Tom, Thomas Tuai's writing there. Next one. Um, okay, so to cut a long and very fascinating and, and interesting story short, um, after his period in England, he um, nearly died in England. and. The missionaries who were looking after him said if he, he was dying of a European disease, he had something like tuberculosis or, or some uh, lung complaint, and if he, pray, if he converted to the European God and believed in God and would go and do his work in New Zealand, God's work in New Zealand, God would save him from this European disease, which is kind of logical because it's a European disease, therefore it'd have a European God that would cause it. And uh, in fact, they had a name for this disease, which was Mr. Coffee. And when I came across Mr. Coffee in the archive, I couldn't work out who it was until I realized it was Mr. Coffee was actually <laughs> cough, cough. <laughs> um, that was, had taken up possession of two eyes entrails, as you said, and was eating him from the inside out, which was a way in which Māori did talk about illnesses of being possessed by a spirit um, that was eating their insides. 
And so the missionaries persuaded Tuai that if he was going to live, he would have to convert to Christianity. And Tuai did actually one night said, okay, I will believe in your God to save me. Um, and this was a huge issue. This is a huge thing for him because that very night he had a visitation uh, from his dead father and his dead brother who came to him. He was actually on a ship uh, leaving London at the time and they came and visited him. They were very sad and they said, why are you giving up your gods? And um, they went away, said Tuai, they went away in sorrow. So there's Tuai having this incredibly difficult psychological battle with himself that he's so ill, he needs to live. He needs to believe in the European God in order to get better. And his ancestors are visiting him, telling him, uh, asking him why he is abandoning his own. I mean, it's astonishing, really, that this can happen, that Tuai is thinking like this. And so Tuai gets better. And so, alleluia, all the Pahias are very happy because now we have a convert. And Tuai, all the way back to New Zealand on the ship, is battling this bargain he's made with the European God. And he is harassed and harassed and harassed by the missionaries. He tra he's travelling back to New Zealand in 1819 with a new group of missionaries who are going to form the second settlement in New Zealand. Tuai is expecting that they will come to him in Ngari Raumati, hoping that they will, and obviously he koro koro will be wanting that. Partway through the journey home, Tuai has what I think could be called almost like a nervous breakdown, um, where he decides that he will not actually take up the European God, he will return to his own Atua. He's coming close to New Zealand, he knows he's moving back into Te Ao Māori, and he is loyal to his own his own ways so um and there are a lot of letters written um at this time by the missionaries to to i and Titi saying you are ungrateful for everything we've done for you you have now gone back to your heathen superstitions um you know we are very disappointed in you and you can imagine that to i and Titi would have felt very upset about this because they felt a debt of gratitude and loyalty to their European friends. Um, but they could not, under the conditions, they could not simply take on this burden of the Christian God and the desire and the, the, the desires of the Christian God to completely change the cultural makeup of, of Maori society. And I mean they were going back to see Koro Koro and, and Hongeka. These were mighty rangatira. They were just gonna laugh at them if they'd said, Oh, well, you can't fight anymore. They would go, Oh yeah, right. It wasn't going to work. So they got back to New Zealand. Um, and again, I'm cutting a huge, long, fascinating story short. And not long after they got back to New Zealand, um, Hongihika took off. Uh, he was briefed by Tuai. He actually um, would have talked to Tuai about England and learnt about the Tower of London where that held thousands of muskets, learnt about the Napoleonic Wars and how um, Pākehās fought, which was every warrior has a gun, not just the rangatira, etc, etc. And also would have discussed, um, no doubt, the mining situation over there because Hongiheka immediately got on a ship um, with Kendall with a list of the settlers he wanted for his um, his his area, he wanted Pākehā soldiers, he wanted miners, farmers, etc. He had a list of the settlers he was going to get from England. When Tuai got back to New Zealand, to the Bay of Islands, immediately when the ship arrived, Koro Koro came over to the Bay of Islands, Hongiheka came down to the beach, and Marsden, with this new set of Pākehā that had been bought from England with Tuai, the decision was made right then and there. Hongiheka was saying, you can have any land you want. Koro Koro was saying, you can have any land of mine that you want. So both were offering any amount of land to this new group of Pākehā. Hongiheka had got Marsden right where he wanted him. And he gained the second group. So the second group of Pākehās in 1819 were the ones who went to Kiri Kiri. That was um, Kemp and... Um, Butler. And so 
this was utterly the tipping point for Ngāri Raumati. Um, and Koro Koro was disgusted and said that uh, Marsden and the Pākehā were utterly ungrateful for the fact that his son, uh, that his brother, Tuai, had gone and endured these hardships in England and there was nothing to show for it. Marsden made a show of going over to, um, down to Ngāri Raumati territory and sort of marking out a bit of land and saying, yes, we'll put some Pākehās here. But in fact, they only ever sent a, a person who was uh, making salt who, um, and salted fish, because of course there's a lot of fish in that area, and he was a bit of a bad egg. Uh, nobody liked him, he was a bit of a drunk, and the Māori in Ngāri Raumati thought they were very badly done by, and he was basically booted out of the area. And everybody was, um, in Ngāri Raumati was angry, upset, and frightened, I can imagine, mm -hmm. because now Hongiheka had come back with, from England with also with a managed to get a lot of guns, and he had the Pākehās, and he had the blacksmiths, and he had what he wanted. Following then, again, long story short, he began his massive raids to the south, where he was taking revenge for a number of previous battles, and Tuai joined him, as did Koro Koro and Kaipo. So what you have suddenly is this huge alliance of the north, of all these tribes that have been fighting each other, coming together and having these huge war parties going down to Tamaki here, to the to this city, to Hauraki, to uh, Rotorua, to Makoya, down the Waikato over a number of years, killing thousands of people in a, a sort of peculiar period, which I'm sure many people will write about even even more than they have now. The sort of Seems like a kind of madness somehow to me. Um, and there's, we discuss in here why Tuai and Koro Koro and Kaipo actually aligned with Ngāpuhi to, to have this. It's a quite a complicated and interesting idea about why they would align. Um, Koro Koro and Kaipo were killed during these uh, raids and Tuai came, survived and came back. And this was sort of 1823 when he finally, after being away probably three years fighting on and off, um, he had ha he was very skinny by now and he had his whole face, um, the moko done on his whole face, despite the fact that the missionaries had said he must not do that. Um, he had his convict, his slaves, um, his, his captives, should I say, and he went back to his pa here, Kahuwera. Here's a picture of the pa in the background. Um, which he had now taken over from Koro Koro. And this picture in, is a wonderful sketch by a Frenchman done in 1824, just a few months before Tuai had died. There's Tuai standing up in the canoe. You can see him to the left in European clothes. He, con he always wore European clothes after he came back from Europe. He had a selection of hats and feathers, jackets and coats, um, and was uh, also had a tin cup with his name on it, out of which he drank tea. And Hongiheka too got a taste for tea, so Hongiheka was constantly calling in on his missionaries to have his cup of tea in the morning for breakfast. And mm -hmm. there's lovely little things like this. Mm -hmm. So um, if you just go to the next slide, um, this, is a, this was um, a, a sort of sanitized version of that previous one. The, the, the previous one was a sketch from someone who was actually in New Zealand. This one was made for one of the many books that were made up in um, Europe following the, the journals going back to Europe and they'd be have sort of sanitized illustrations like this one that would be sent out in different languages like French and German and English to tell the world about the Maori people. And the next slide just shows you also um, a photo that I took of the pa. And you can still see the same shape there. And though, so that canoe would have been on the water in front of it. And you can still see the palisade to the left, mm. um, at, which has been broken down a lot um, by cattle, unfortunately. And if you look carefully, you can still see where the houses were um, on that um, hillside of the pa. Okay, well, and that's so 1824, that year, the French came um, to visit. A French scientific expedition came and Tuai sat on that ship, La Coquille, 
for 10 days while that ship was in harbour and just talked. He talked to the captain in English about, he taught him waiata, um, prayers. He, as I said before, he talked about marriage, Maori customs. He talked about Maori society. And the luckily for us, those scientists wrote it down. So we have this wonderful account of Maori life at that time in 1824, as told by Tuai. Tuai was pissed off with the, um, the missionaries on the other side of the bay. And he quite liked the French because the French didn't like the missionaries either because the French were Catholics, of course, mm -hmm. and the missionaries were Anglicans and they all hated each other. So um, Tuai was quite enamoured of the French who had no time for the <laughs> missionaries over in um, Kiri Kiri. Um, now, later that year, unfortunately, we hear that Tuai had died. We don't know what he died of, but he came onto a ship that happened to be in the harbour at the time uh, to get some medicine, which of course in those days were just about only leeches, um, but, and he died of unknown causes. He was a young man, he was 27 years old, he had a young baby and a wife. Um, on his death, his wife killed the baby and herself, uh, which is, was um, a custom. And so Tuai had no issue. Um, and within two years, that pa, Kahuera, had been taken over by the um, allies of Ngapuhi, who overtook the entire region. So Tuai was basically just holding things in place um, until and after his death, um, the what was had predicted was going to happen was the Ngāpuhi forces were now strong enough to move um, into this this area. And the last two slides, if you could just show those, um, Avril, here's a picture of the pa in 1826 that is um, being wrecked. It looks pretty good there, but it's. Um, there, it's apparently the broken par, according to, and the, that particular image, go to the next, have a look at that slide. That This is taken from exactly the same position. If you go back, if you go back a slide, Avril. Uh, so you see that funny looking mountain to the left there that looks like it's got snow on it. Well, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that it's just that headland. Yeah. So the foreground is that is the par, mm -hmm. the par on the top there. I just like that because it, I love being able to map on those old yeah. pictures to the mm -hmm. to the modern times. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, yeah, so the French, um, so Marsden actually turned up in New Zealand again. I think that same year, eighteen twenty six, twenty seven, and he went over to um, Kahuera Pa. The people, he said, had been dispersed by Ngāpuhi and were um, very s sad about what had happened. And um, Marsden said he wept for Tuai um, and for what had happened to the people. And um, I can't but help in the end of the book without, you know, I don't want to tell you the sad ending really because it is like a story. But you can imagine that Tuai would have wanted to be looking out and uh, to the oceans and have his ships and his Pākehā. Mm. And yet Marsden felt sorry for him and his people. And yet Marsden himself, by not forming the kind of relationship with Tuai that Tuai wanted, mm. had brought on, you know, was part of yeah. this kind of this huge historic shift in um, tribal power and the destruction of, um, of Ngāri Raumati. So that's the kind of Reader's Digest version, I guess, of, of Tuai's life. And he just strikes me as a, as a man who, of, of a real future-oriented intellectual who was very interested in the integration of European technologies, um, schooling, clothing, etc., customs, into his own um, area. Um, for the and, and the relationships that he believed that could form and, and the benefits that it could bring to his people. Mm. Yeah, so I guess I'm just really introducing a story which I hope that you'll be motivated enough to want to read mm. um, in, in more detail. So we, we might have a couple of minutes for um, comments or conversation. Is that a good idea? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I think yeah, we can just open up. Anybody wants to make a comment?
comment, ask a question. I think I'll just go for it. I'm keen to know where, where your sources came from. How did you find all of this amazing, fascinating information? Um, well, we, we've worked uh, a hell of a lot of information is now available through the Marsden Online um, Archive in um, Hocken, which I really recommend. It's, it's a world-class archive with fabulous searching um, capabilities. And there's a, all the missionary letters uh, journals and so on that are related to particularly Marsden, Samuel Marsden, are all um, digitised um, and that, that was a wonderful source. We also, um, I mean, I went through archives in London, in Shropshire, um, Paris um, um, and of course in Australia at the Mitchell Library. Um, so the information about 2i and here at the uh, Grey Collection at the um, Auckland Public Library. So the information is, is, is out there, but as I said, he is really the, the most written about Māori person of this period. There's nobody else that you could write this kind of story about because he had, there was so much hope put in him, mm -hmm. you know, and so everyone was by the missionaries, by the missionaries. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and they were following him around with their quills, writing down virtually mm -hmm. everything he ever thought. Um, in order to see if there was a way that they could convert him. And they were very interested in him. I mean, he was an intellectual. He liked to discuss. He loved to argue. Um, and he liked to swear as well, which they, um, you know, Māori didn't swear. Swearing was not something Māori did. But he liked to practice swearing, and the missionaries <laughs> were not happy about that. <laughs> Hanging out with those whalers. Yes, yeah, exactly. Right. Hanging out with the whalers. He he hung out with any Europeans who'd have a conversation, I think. Mm. I think it's really striking is um, how rigid and stupid on some level the Europeans were, you know, naive ideas about how easy it would be to change another pe other people's culture. And and you know how do, how yeah how well, I guess so if you, smart and well, so stupid well I think that they know they knew that they had the truth just as today I yeah, mean the trouble. I, I think European Pakia today in terms of religion culture economy and so on do believe that we have the truth and and mm -hmm. and the truth in that particular particularly two hundred years ago the religious truth um, was. It was imperative that people followed this religious religious truth mm. for their own good. That's true. And so they were utterly convinced of the correctness of their. But they couldn't. Mm. They didn't. Be, they couldn't begin to enter the Maori world. Unlike, I mean, Kendall Thomas Kendall, who was one of the missionaries, did enter the Maori world. Mm. Um, he was taught by Tuai and then um, Tohunga, who taught him about uh, Maori knowledge, and. Um, he, he basically had his own nervous breakdown because he mm. couldn't deal with the tensions between his Christian mm. beliefs and Maori beliefs. He also had an affair with a Maori woman and mm. he was booted out of the, um, of the Church Missionary mm. Society as a result. So, um, fascinating talk. Thank you, Alison, and thank mm. you to Cooney as well. Um, um, and um, uh, what I'm fascinated about, I mean, you know, you're talking about dogmatic ideas. I mean, we've lived with the religion of neoliberalism for the last 20 or 30 years, and if it's challenged, people get very dogmatic. So mm -hmm. I can understand what missionaries are like. I mean, they're like people we know now. You know, some of them are running for office at the moment um, in our general election. What, what intrigues me is that those early, the, the early contact people with the missionaries were all pretty staunch. Um, I mean, Henry Williams went for 10 years before he got his first baptism. That's right. So, and that's another 10 years later. What, what I, I mean, this is outside your book, Alison, but you must have an idea about it. What happened in the mid 1830s that led to mass conversions, all of the, the, the you know, the, the Rangatira decided, the whole community decided they're going to be Wesleyans or Anglicans or Catholics. Yeah. Catholics. yeah, yeah. Um, and each hapu sort of went different ways for all sorts of strategic Māori reasons, mm. but nevertheless, all of that resistance that Tuai represented for his whole life, right through, he wore the European clothes, but not the European God. Mm. And so, 
why within 10 years did it, did it change? Can I just add one or two other little things in? Yeah. Um, did Tu I speak Te Reo Māori in a way which didn't require the WH sound that later gets brought in? Yes, yes, I think that... Um, because Kendall wrote it down. Later, yes, right? that's right. And I think... Tukabutanga and, and the Treaty have all got no way WH. Yeah, and um, Hongi is spelt with SH mm. and so on. I mean, I think that these dialectical differences um, were... And, and the, I think the language itself, the northern language is, itself, was, was di different then as well. And, and, and you do get that, a capture of that mm -hmm. in those earliest books. But the mass conversions in the 1830s, and this was sort of like, you know, within um, 10 years, or he died in 1824, but say 10 years after he died, to I died. I, that doesn't surprise me in the slightest, because by this stage, the guns that had entered into um, Maori warfare were creating an impossible situation. Literally thousands of people were being killed. And when Tuai came down here to Tamaki with Ngāpuhi, they actually, nobody down here in Hauraki or Tamaki had a gun. They hadn't seen these. And in fact, they would stand incomprehending mm -hmm. in front of guns, wondering why people were falling around them. Mm -hmm. How on earth could this happen? Yeah, yeah. So they were easily killed. And or they would go into their um, pa, which was well palisaded. All that Ngāpuhi and Tuai was involved with this, he um, had to do was to build a great, you know, and they could spend a week doing it or more build a great tower outside the um, Palisades and just get onto it and pick people off. Mm -hmm. So they could murder people within, men, women and children within a Palisaded area. Mm -hmm. And the, such was the terror of these weapons. And so um, widely used were they against people who didn't yet have them. The only way to break into the inevitable um, balance of utu that would that was required in these in these um, skirmishes. The only way to break into this was to say, "I am a man of peace. I am now no longer part of this cultural frame. I am now taking up the Christian God, and the Christian God is a God of peace." That is, and so it doesn't surprise me in the slightest because that was the only way, as far as I can see, that they could cut into this. It was a madness, David. You know, I mean, mm. some of the descriptions we read in here are just heartrending and unbelievable. And I, I'm sure in the future that psychologists and others, um, Maori psychologists particularly, will write about what happened in this in this astonishing period, short period, relatively, mm. of time, um, where you had this utter power from the north just coming south, annihilating. Mm huge groups of people. Now, how was that going to be stopped? And it could only be stopped by a chief saying, I'm not part of this. I'm not going to fight back. I'm not going to be any part of it. And so once that starts to happen, the whole system of re retributive mm. attacks just have to, have to fall away. I mean, that's a simple answer, but th mm. that's the only way I can understand it because it's absolutely true. There was this dramatic shift caused by the technology, the introduction of the technology that was so desired and so admired. You know, I mean, Tuai in London, he would have seen these paintings of the Napoleonic Wars and all the soldiers, and they went to the Tower of London and they saw thousands of guns that were all arranged in these displays. And T. Teddy could not understand why they couldn't give him one. There were so many thousands, why not give me one? He couldn't, couldn't understand that. And they were on ships with cannons. They saw the cannons being fired. They saw rope being made. They saw ships being made down at the dockyards near London. So they saw this booming, massive technology, which must have been mind-bending, and, and wanted it for part of their own you know, political and cultural purposes. Mm -hmm. um, oh, my goodness, look at that. We suddenly got big. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's finally caught up with us. I'm just aware of the people out there. Um, actually, I think we're losing people, maybe. Mm -hmm. But whether or not um, there are yeah, questions. And comments. Well, it's supposed to be 4.30. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's comments or questions from people not in this room. 
They're all sitting there silently. Maybe they can't hear us. I hope they can. <laughs> yeah, they must be able to. I can see some uh, smiles. Otherwise, we can just keep on chatting and you guys can keep listening. Um, no, no there's good? somebody there. Is that Canterbury? And oh, I, I was just going to say I'm really enjoying listening, actually. Um, I mean, this is material that... Um, well, I'll be able to draw on in my teaching, I guess, trying to give students a more sophisticated understanding of, you know, of this world, um, you know, that has informed the development of our society today. So, I mean, um, it, it's fabulous. It's great to listen to. Thank you. Cool there. And it's, it's really interesting thinking, you know, when you said that about Mars and at the end, and it's interesting to think, wow, if they had got, if two I had been successful in getting, and quarter quarter had been successful in getting some party out for their side, how different would that whole history potentially have been about yeah. the growth of Ngāpui, the kind of, their ability to kind of get that massive concentration of power and then go out and, mm -hmm. you know, get all their revenge yeah. for previous injustices that they had experienced and all that followed from that you mm. just I mean, we can't imagine how different it might have been but no you can't imagine how but but that is that's the conclusion you have to come to mm. that these decisions that were made between Hungihika and Marsden in particular Marsden for his own purposes you know they had massive potentially massive impact on the history of the of the tribal the balance of um, power. Ba the balance of power. Yeah. 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 So the, the book's too big. It's sitting on my desk at the moment. That's by Andrew oh, the Sharp. Yes, that one. Uh, the, the, I've read the, the conclusion. <laughs> but but I, what I gather Andrew is saying is that um, that uh, Marsden's reputation is, is wrong on both accounts. Mm. That on as, as, as for being a harsh magistrate, he was probably less harsh than most magistrates in New South Wales in those times. Mm. It all looks pretty harsh to us because lots of people got flogged and so on. Mm. But he wasn't actually all that harsh a magistrate. His reputation also has been a good missionary. And Andrew suggests that he's not a particularly good missionary. Is this part of the story that, 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 um, that's reflected there? Yes. That, that he made some bad decisions? Yes, yes, very much. And also there was, um, you know, the, the question of, um, what's it mutually assured assured destruction as well mm. the way that he on the one hand we think he he did allow guns to be traded mm. and on the other hand saying guns could not be traded meant that it, it reduced the the um, ability for the guns to be distributed mm. so once you've got guns you know concentrated mm. in certain hands rather than which Kendall wanted guns to be handed out left right and centre Mm. Um, because he believed that that would have a better effect than mm. just concentrating mm. it. Yeah. And so all that was mm. part of Marsden's, you know, misunderstanding or, you know, ability not to be able to see through. But, I mean, it's easy for us to say that now, of course, you know, with the hindsight. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, boy, it was an amazing time. Is there any evidence, you know, you said Marsden Is there any evidence that he understood his own part in what happened to Marirawati? Um, I suspect he did, but he was a very right kind of man um, and he would have blamed um, Ngāri Raumati for and Tuai for not becoming Christian and becoming peaceful. And once you get involved with guns, you know, it all bets are off. And so they died by the very hand that they, you know, that they wanted to in a sense. Um, they wanted guns. They wanted part of, of all this world. So they died by it. So I suspect that, um, you know, his, his, his righteousness would have been such that he... Would have saved him. Yeah. Feeling guilty. Yeah. <laughs> it's so schizophrenic, isn't it? The European relationship. It still is. Them. Because, yeah, so on the one hand, peace, love, you know, Christianity. On the other hand, they're armed to the teeth <laughs> with, um, and able to kind of, you know, assert their will militarily yeah absolutely so there was no chance Somebody. yeah could i could i just ask i mean it's a little bit uh i guess this is evidence or it's a story that um uh, could be taken a particular way by by people i guess i'm just thinking about what this means for us you know what this sort of story 
means it's it's troubling in some sense you know the um the uh actions i guess of hongi hika i know that had repercussions for my own people over in um uh, hicks bay Te Araroa. um so you know what do we do with this i guess i'd kind of rethought some of the work i'd been exposed to when i was doing history in my undergrad um and parsonson some of her work and looking back at that through a cope of a maori lens I guess I, in my head, had decided that was a little bit of a deficit analysis, but mm -hmm. then maybe that's a little bit simplistic as well, um, given what you're you're sharing with us. But the comp complexities and intricacies, um, and the fact that that you know, Tu uh, you know, somehow got involved. Uh, I guess in in those actions that we would look upon, yeah, like as a madness. Hmm. Um, I guess I'm just grappling with what this means <laughs> and and how to convey that in a way uh, that people wouldn't pick up on the um, yeah wouldn't wouldn't look at it through a deficit lens. Hmm. Yes, I understand exactly what you're saying. The idea of the kind of the thrill of savagery, if you like, um, which is a narrative that can be picked up out of that too. Yeah. Um, I think that it, oh, when you're teaching this kind of stuff, it's just about impossible um, because you're up against the, all, you know, those strong d discourses that you're talking about. Um, but I guess what we've tried to do here is to make um, Tuai's story as day-to-day -day and as human and as complicated as possible. I mean, right. that's hard, you know, because so much of our history is taught in terms of this leader who who killed these people and formed this alliance and then this happened and you know it's the, the complexity of human relationships and of the human psyche if you like um and human desires and the pressures in the context all those things work on us all the time and i agree with you it's incredibly difficult to avoid certain interpretations that will be taken off inevitably in the directions that people will already want to take them but all we can do is just keep talking you know when you talk about talking truth to power i mean you've got to talk complexity to power as well that these that the complexity of, of human life and human decision making and human engagement is what maori and Pākehā relationships are all about not just 200 years ago but today and the more we reduce them to simple ideas of good park, bad park, yeah, good Māori, you know, blah, blah, those simple binaries, the, the more we get away from these inevitable complexities which form our relationships and which are often contradictory as well. You know, it's not that we're ruling out contradiction either. But the more capacity we have to embrace contradiction and complexity, uh, the more we're able to understand each other and I think to, to move forward with all these, this, but this information uh, that we have. What you've foregrounded is Māori agency and Māori autonomy. Mm. Uh, and so other people a bit later, like um, Katu Taropraha, mm. um, Tamihana Taropraha, um, from the next generation, mm. uh, have got all that complexity as well. Yes. Yeah, the Pākehā dress and the Pākehā way, but also the, um, the cause for Māori king and, uh, you know, mm. and and do get involved in, in, in the wars against the, the mm. Bagar crown. Mm. So, uh, so foregrounding a Māori agency and autonomy seems to be a really strong point of what you said today. Absolutely. And, and that's, that, is a, 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 that is something that we don't often hear because it's usually assumed that this is a story of how Māori responded to Bagar. Yes. Rather than... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Māori sorting things out yeah. strategically yeah. within our Māori, that's yes. exactly right. Mm. And that's a good point that you make, David, because that's exactly what we tried to do here. Yeah. That we did not want to tell the usual story, which is Māori response to Pākehā. You know, and, and so Pākehā, Māori are always the responders, the victims, the, the other, if you like, of the main actors. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's why we really tried to, you know, to yeah. turn that story up. And I think you can do that in, in, in all the, the, the stories of history. You, know, you can turn the Māori story to be the dominant, the central story, mm. and you find another, another thing again from the, the dominant, which mm. is the response of, you know, we're responding to you baddies or we're responding to you missionaries or mm. whatever. Mm. Mm. Right. Okay. 
Um, I'm just aware of the time. Yeah, it's dropping out there. And yeah, people are starting to leave, and we all need to leave, I guess. Yes. Um, so thank you so much, Alison. I think it's you know it's such a yeah interesting, complicated, rich story, and and it does just the thing that I think these kind of well, you know, that there's the story of a, a man, one man, and there's the other people around them, but then there's just so many other things that that are attached to that story that you can actually pick up in the conversation that we've been having about the you know the ripples that go out from that and the ramifications of it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. thank you and Cooney. Mm, yes, Cooney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kia ora Cooney. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Kia ora, Coach.